All right, hello. Okay, so first the story I also deleted by production database. I was even, you know, more of an adventurer. I basically deleted the entire folder. I did not have a backup and it was 3 a.m. So I had to improvise. So I found a, an app that restores your disk. That worked that time. So if that helps with the collection, great. All right, so I'm Nemanja. This talk is called Complaints and Grievances. And this talk covers the tales from the Chronicles of Living Spec. Now, my former team manager is here. I wish I'd known, but I didn't. So we're gonna stick to what happened in Living Spec. Um, basically, I never hear a talk that complains much. All right, usually talks are very kind of, you know, everything worked, everything is awesome. Now we've been doing this company, well, Living Spec started as an idea or in some form five years ago, there's some shit that has transpired and it was not perfect. So I kind of did an agenda. I did my best, but every single time I went through the agenda, I tried to rehearse the talk. It was always different. So I figure we're all in this together. So if the talk sucks, it's your fault as well as mine. So less pressure on me. Awesome. So this is what we're, we're going to cover today. Of course, complaints and grievances is a George Carlin stand-up, so for all you fans out there, shout out. And I kind of did topics in a kind of, you know, um, witty way. I was bored. So the, we are going to talk about a co comedy of priorities, but this wasn't even on the menu. The transformation of team dynamics and usage and abusage of AI. That's a book on English. I kind of did a spin on it because I was clever. So. <laughs> To kind of set the tone for the talk, I picked a couple of quotes. Why? It helps me warm up. You know, this is the first time I'm doing a talk such as this, so every bit helps. So Arthur Schopenhauer was, I'm not sure whether anyone is aware of the person, he was a very kind of, you know, negative philosopher. So what he said was basically, I have not written for the crowd. I hand down my work to the thinking individuals who in the course of time will appear as rare exceptions. They will feel as I felt, or as a shipwrecked sailor feels on a desert island, for whom the trace of a farmer fellow sufferer affords more consolation, and yada, yada. This is a fancy way of saying, you know, they invited me to do this talk, and I'm kind of needed to vent a bit, and, you know, psychologists can be a bit expensive, so, you know, that's just what we're going to do today. The second one is from George Carlin, and I think it describes me. I don't have pet peeves, I have major psychotic fucking hatreds. Now, everyone that talked to me knows that I do not just calmly look at a PR and say, huh, well, that's nice. We can improve it. No, no, that's not the way it transpires. Usually Dylan knows. The rest of the team <laughs> may, may hear the second version. And this is one by me, just, you know, for my partner. I'm getting to an age where a girlfriend seems silly. So, honey, can you please help do the slides for this talk I have? No, there's no money involved. But she did the slides, so... Without further ado, uh, actually, no, there's still a bit more. All right. So about me. So I started working in about 2009. I did a lot of things before Living Spec 2019, sort of. It's really all a blur. I'm not sure whether anyone had a startup. It's like a, like a black hole, which just sucks in time. So I, you, you'll just have to trust me or not. So we started about 2019. And I wanted to attach this photo because I had a full set of hair there. Um, during the course of the startup, I became bald. The project is still out there. You know, I think there's a correlation. Fuck knows, it's just what it is. Um, so the first kind of bit is called the comedy of priorities. Now, I did this kind of witty couple of things to kind of, you know, set the mood. So. This kind of talks about how we started with the project and basically I started alone. Um, I had an idea of how things could be done better because I went through a couple of companies and they just all did things in a very weird way. One of the stories was they basically had five ways of capturing requirements. So there I am reading about something, a book called U Writing Effective Use Cases and bam, like I, I think we can do that. So basically what I thought up was a multi-purpose document collaboration. Well, I didn't. That's what the marketing team came up with years later, but you know, it seems nice. Um, so basically this is, is, and 
you know, I was working at this, with this company at the time. So what I did was I, came, I approached the people and said, look, guys, I have this neat idea. Should we consider it? And blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. We love it. We want to get on board. We sign a joint uh, venture agreement. It feels like a company is getting started and whatnot. So I, you know, I kind of say, Yo, I don't want to do development. <laughs> Oh shit. I don't want to do development. I just want to kind of, you know, be in a different role because I don't think a technical founder is the best thing because I'm just going to get sucked into tech. So, you know, let's just do it as efficiently as possible and let's just exclude me as a factor because I don't have an experience building a company. So, a data set, we're supposed to have the first meeting where we're supposed to set up priorities. We're supposed to set up, you know, what we're going to do in, oops, in the coming period. So there I am, researching, how, how are we going to do this? This is a collaborative app. You know, you have to collaborate. You have to do this. You have to do that. Holy shit, there's a lot of things to do from the business perspective as well. How are we going to manage a team? I personally dislike Scrum. You know, your mileage may vary. So I'm looking at alternatives. I'm looking like, hey, you know, there's extreme programming, which I like. There's this process called the Rational Unified Process. So I start researching that. So, and then kind of there's other things, you know, collaborative app, you need an audit log. So we pick an architect, well, I pick an architecture called event sourcing. I did not exactly know how it's done, all right? Because there was a full team of people behind me. So I said, fuck it, it's gonna work, right? So there's the meeting and they've been, they've been pushing off the meeting saying, hey, you know what? We're waiting on a React expert. Perfect, I'm not an expert in React, so I'll wait. All right, so there's the meeting and we get started and then I'm sharing my, you know, very enthusiastically sharing my thoughts. And the React expert, basically I'm talking about collab and whatnot. We're not gonna, do, we shouldn't do collab. I'm like, why not React expert? Well, you know, they did it in Evernote, maybe, I, I don't know. Um, and it didn't work, so we should lock one of the users while the other user is editing. So multi-purpose document collaboration tool initially didn't have Collaboration, awesome. Um, so, you know, but I figure, you know what? There's a big team, so we'll just wait, right? Everything is gonna come into place. All right, the technical director was supposed to, uh, CTO of the company was supposed to help with event sourcing and stuff. And he basically just said, oh, all those buzzwords. He was Spanish. Right? Uh, anyway, uh, so basically the meeting went terribly. However, there was a big team, so I was happy. What happened was, <laughs> what happened was uh, the company went into trouble a month later. So we started off with this large amount of energy, a team, and it just crashed a month later. Why? Well, they went into some trouble and whatnot. So basically, we had nothing. So we set out priorities. The priorities kind of get, got kind of mangled, and we had nothing which was kind of the first venture of mine into the business world. You know, risk-driven development didn't work out. So, you know, the first thing I kind of learned is you really want to tackle the risky things first, otherwise your project is not going to get there. So at the time I meet Dylan and things start getting fun, right? Because we start working on a project. I start working full-time-ish and whatnot. So these decisions that we missed start to bite us. Why? We're raising money for a collaborative tool. We cannot collaborate, all right? So, problem. So we start trying to make it collaborative. Now, ironically, the previous talk said 20 minutes. Well, it was three or four months more, all right? It was painful, it was very painful for us. So one of the engineers we had did research and it was two competing libraries, AutoMerge and YJS. The engineer says, well, AutoMerge is awesome and YGS is kind of, eh, it kind of works, but you know. So what happened was we picked AutoMerge. Months in, the fucking thing doesn't work. All right? It works in 20 minutes as advertised essentially, but what happens is the server starts crashing. Why? It's running out of memory. Why? Well, AutoMerge keeps a history of the messages ad infinitum, you know, so server crashes. And it basically cra and keeps adding memory every time you click a button. Press a button, adds memory. So we reach out to the people, and this is basically open source go goes wrong. We reach out to the people and we're like, look, guys, it's really not working. Can we talk? And yes, we talk, and we kind of try and fix it. But in the end, they say, we're going to solve your problems. This is where JavaScript fucking shines. We're going to solve your problems. You just need to use Wasm. 
All right, well, how? I mean, all right, we'll try it. But guys, it doesn't work in, in Webpack. <laughs> we use Webpack, right? It doesn't work in Webpack, so what are we supposed to do? Well, you use Wasm and try not to type too much or use it for too long. Matter of fact, just tell the users to read this white paper we wrote in user imagination, the possibilities. What we did right back then was we created an abstraction, something that nobody talks about in these conferences, I feel. We created an abstraction around AutoMerge and it then came time to actually make things work because we said these guys are assholes. All right, you know, don't put that in, maybe they'll see it. Um, we're just gonna use YJS. The abstraction held and we use YJS and we never looked back. However, we learned so much from the failure that was AutoMerge that the abstraction was actually reasonable. And it took us months, but you know, we never look back. So abstractions, important. JavaScript, no, not likey abstractions, but hey, the community. So basically in the same arc, we have this dependency, this large dependency of, of ours. It's an editor, all right? This is also part of Collab in a way. This editor is so important to us, yet a, what you see is what you get collaborative editor is so difficult to fucking do, all right? So it's not, and basically, it's not just that, it's not just the editor. You have to do the UI, you have to do the list, you have to do this, you have to do that. So we're, of course, of course a small, small startup team. So we pick a library called Slate Plugins at the time. Slate Plugins does as advertised for us, right? Dylan basically joins, becomes the maintainer because he's just a wizard that way. He just asks. That's an American thing, by the way. They ask and they get stuff. It's, <laughs> it, it is incredible. Two times, both Slate plugins and Slate itself, the editor, I swear to God, he just said, hey, can you give me maintainer access? And the guy said, sure. <laughs> that happened, that happened. I'm not even, it's difficult to make these things up. Um, so Plate, uh, Slate plugins later known as Plate, and, um, basically what they do is they have this nifty product uh, library at the beginning. However, as time progresses, the author becomes creative, all right? and starts going into every new thing he finds, all right? So Redux is apparently too heavy, so he switches to Zustand, which is again ironic that it was mentioned in the first call, but not enough. No, he creates his own wrapper of Zustand called Zustud. <laughs> and it was like, why, dude, for fuck, why? And why are you changing the entire contract? Like create an abstraction, it's like, oh mommy, the bald guy's talking curse words again. Like wrap it up, then be creative in your little box. So we kind of live through that somehow. I bitch to Dylan, he kind of listens and you know, it's like marriage, but it works. But then several years later, the guy does the most awesome thing I've ever seen in web development. I, and I just wonder if you guys saw this. It's called shadow UI or shadow something, all right? So there's a way of creating components. And usually what you do is, we did this as developers, all right? I'm not that old, but fuck it, we do this all the time. You export the library of components and the author, whoever that is, maintains that library. They provide extension points, you extend what you need, you kind of live with it, they maintain it. Perfect for us, you know? Well, he said, I don't like that. And instead, you're gonna we, we're using the shadow CDN thing. So me and Dylan are looking at what the hell is that? So apparently what you do is you copy components and you paste them into your, into your code. And we're like, why? What the, how is this popular? And if you have compound components, like a component that references five other components, you copy all of them. And it's like the most simple question is, first, how do I do this efficiently? Well, of course they have a CLI. <laughs> you copy automatically, Jesus Christ. But then the question is, how do I upgrade? And they have an experimental, I swear, experimental approach to upgrading that is essentially diffs. So you upgrade things, and then you look at two diffs, and then you make changes. We have a limited budget here, people. That's not how it works. So we haven't switched to the library. We're still thinking what to do, but Priorities, stable, we need stability in this ecosystem. I'm not sure what, it's like a curse word, I swear. All right, so basically the next bit, and I lost my clicker thingy apparently. Um, the next bit is, that's all right, I have it. The next bit then follows living spec through its early employees and contractors or cons consultants, I, I apologize. 
this is really painful, all right? This was really painful for me. So there we have our early employees and we have this project and we want to set certain things up, all right? So we pick this architecture, CQRS, whatnot, and it has this thing where you have to regenerate view models, but you know, there's a lot of things that go on in a production of an app. So they're supposed to, we're supposed to regenerate view models in parallel. Does not matter if you know what that is, just remember there's a requirement, that's it. So this engineer comes along and he's really smart looking the code and saying, you know, all right, I'm going to take that. So apart from that, we have also zero downtime deployment, all the well stuff a project needs. Oops. But, you know, so he looks at it and basically we're working on what was um, discussed as regeneration or uh, out of sequence event processing for a month. <laughs> however, however, what came out of it is, well, basically, we rewrote what was already there, which was, uh, as I was told, two classes, two object-oriented, not enough JavaScript, whatever the fuck that means. Uh, well, I know what that means, using interfaces and optional types in TypeScript, because, like, all right. And the end result was strict true. So I didn't trust the code was the actual word he said, so I had to do this. Yes, I know this doesn't meet any of the goals we set up, but look, we made it strict. We were not able to solve this problem later. Uh, you know why? Because every project is like a organism, it has certain energy going up and down, all right? So there was no energy later. And also just one thing, guys, every software project has layers, all right? It, it evolves. Stopping and rewriting the entire project just because you've seen an um, old pattern <laughs> just doesn't work, all right? We need to keep moving. So we're stuck, we were stuck, with this problem for a while and the engineer left. So now we had strict in one package. That was the end result. Uncanny, uncanny. So then as time progressed, we started getting consultants. Why? Well, we need help, all right? Consultant sounds important. Consultant sounds smart, I guess. I, um, so we get these, well, there were two people at the time. They joined the project in the first meeting where I'm saying how to get to spin up the development environment. And they say, you do Vagrant Up. Now, I thought that was simple. I thought that was a straightforward request, Vagrant Up. It doesn't, now, well, why don't you use Docker? It's like, who cares? Like, we're using this. Well, everyone uses Docker. And I'm like, our, so it was a week going back and forth on Docker until I basically said, Look, do whatever the fuck you want in your own machine. Put whatever you do in a local Git ignore, local, so not on the Git ignore of the project, and do whatever you want. We lost an enormous amount of time, and here's the secret with getting the dev uh, development environment up. You do it once, all right? Once. Uh, you, you have to do it some more time, but we have Vagrant, so, you know. It is really not important that much. So, basically, that was kind of my first not first, but very kind of difficult um, bout with consultants. So at a certain point, we get to a different issue we have, we had, which was our, uh, basically the database client we use was inefficient. And it was inefficient because we wanted to stream things. Not to get into streaming, that doesn't really matter. But it was inefficient to stream and we needed to solve the streaming issue. Now we do the profiles, we do everything and we pinpoint the issue. And the issue, quite obviously, was the fact that the database itself is sending a format that is not streamable. It's sending everything in a string and we need to convert it to objects. Now, you only do that in a special, with a specialized for specialized being a very heavy word, is JSONL, all right? It's just not a comma, it's a new line, I mean. Um, so we get into it and the consultant basically says, all right, I produced a performance imp improvement. And what he did was, he basically uh, created, well, uh, this. It was 364 change files, it's a fork. It's a fork of, Git of a GitHub repo of 3,000 additions and 3,200 deletions, all right? And I ask the most silly question is, how the fuck am I supposed to maintain that as the library progresses? And that's where we get the quote. Uh, well, I know it's difficult to maintain, but only here to get it into the code base, which is essentially what happened. So we couldn't use this. And here's kind of where open source did it right for us. Later, I kind of reach out to the database and say, hey, look guys, can you consider, that's literally the wording, can you consider adding JSONL? 
streaming? And they say, yes, three changed files, three. And that basically got us the performance bump we wanted, three files, all right? So the consultant charged us or actually billed us for $50,000 for this shit. Why? It had so many changes and deletions, and it was utterly useless. I mean, really? Anywho, basically the end result is, and this is from the Raven guy, we have one of them, uh, Raven guys, we have one of them in attendance. Uh, the end result was, with the changes I've contributed, was like four, five to six kind of improvement. That's all we wanted from the consultant. It's, and it only took reaching out to the people and doing a you know, a pull request. It was an awesome experience. I mean, I encourage everyone, help. If it's an open source project, contribute. That's what they're there for. That's why they're open source. So my last story about architects, and I love this one, I'm not architects, but kind of um, consultants, is I, I, I did a wordplay. My architecture has a bigger dictionary, diction and therefore should be used. Besides, I was hard to, to consult, not listen or think or any of that. So. Another performance issue we had, and we were basically supposed to stream uh, the entire query model back, all right? So I said, I want an app without spinners. Like, fuck it, if, if Steve Jobs can say that, so can I, you know? Let's, let's not have any spinners, right? And it worked. We stream it all back, and it worked. However, it was getting progressively slower, and we needed to resolve it. So these people join us and like, all right, we'll take a look at it and whatnot. So then, and basically they go AWOL for a week or so, and they come back with this. And basically this the page in Living Spec, shameless promotion, uh, is talking about how the idea won't work. All right. And there's a paragraph here or a, 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 in parentheses where they say, given our limited knowledge of RavenDB and the main model. I love that one. I love that one. Well, you're not. Well, how do you know if it's, it's impossible when you don't have any knowledge of the thing? Well, why don't you talk to us first? So I don't have uh, the date on this screenshot. This was September 1st. Basically, the first commit I made was on September 5th resolving this issue or the, the beginning of the resol uh, resolution of the issue. It wasn't difficult. It just required a bit of communication. In, insane in my mind. Um, so that basically leads me to what, uh, what I call transformation of team dynamics, or this is a book I want to write one day called Games Developers Play. So if anyone knows who Eric Byrne is, well, that's basically that everyone plays games and everyone has a certain goal. I think developers are, are very good at this, basically at squeezing out just a bit more time and not paying attention to the fact that the company actually needs to produce stuff. I mean, that's kind of how we make money and pay you to begin with. But so one of the very frequent things I hear when hiring a developer, I love this, you need to trust me and let me do my job. I do not know where this phrase comes from, honestly. Trust is a two-way pro. Why do you think you can join a company and ask the uh, person whatever, you need to trust me? No, I don't. You need to fit in. You need to actually produce results in order for trust to be actually gained or established between the two of us. In the meantime, you are supposed to produce some, some results. And this is where Dylan and I learned that you have to do something about company culture. Now, we laughed because we actually had to say words such as, we expect the person working with us to be curious. Now, you do not expect an adult person needs to hear this, but... That's what it is. You need to communicate and you need to be curious about your job. I thought that was a precondition of joining a company and whatnot. And then usually this thing progresses. And then we have another gem. Uh, on, on our project, we use continuous integration, which is using a single branch. Usually, master. Usually when I say that, people get all bent out of shape. And it's like, why? Don't, isn't it logical that every single commit you make leaves our project in a deployable state? We, in the end, need to deploy. So what's the big, you know, what's the big uh, deal about that? Why do you need feature branches that live for two weeks? And who the fuck is going to merge all of them 
once you go home on Friday and am I really supposed to merge a pull request that has 500 changes? Give me a break, I have a life as well. So we say do, do uh, CI. So you make commits in incrementally that leave the project in a deployable state. I don't know why it's so controversial. People get in, never follow the process, yet it is clearly not working for them. How? How? How do you know? You never even gave it a try. And if CI is an attempt to change mindsets, these people usually don't even attempt that. So, you know, try it for once. Just kind of try and do the thing. You can be, you know, free and creative within the constraints that the, go that the company has. So this was kind of uh, one of the things we established that needs to be done. It's like you will follow this process and you, there's a time and place to bitch and moan about it, but not on a Wednesday, all right? So, you know, team planning, uh, retrospect, sure. You know, complain your heart out, not mid-release, and no, we won't do feature branches ever, all right? The last bit I wanted to kind of talk about is AI. Now, one of the talks before me kind of, you know, talked about similar, similar things, but my example, I feel, was very interesting because I said, all right, robot, let's me and you figure out a network setup. Now, saying that, I have no experience with setting up a network. So we kind of, we needed something, and I actually needed some help. So I figured, fuck it, let's try, let's try ChatGPT. It should know these things. There's an infinite amount of examples there. So I tried it. And basically, I kept asking it questions. I gave it just very much context. I, get, I told it what we have. What, this is like 100 exchange, uh, message in the exchange. It is re really far down. At one point, it tells me there's an SDN router, software defined network router. It actually tells me use an SDN router. And I'm like, holy shit, what's that? How do I see it? Look at all the text. I've, look at that. Uh, the SDN router operates at layer three of the OSI model, which means it works on base. I was like, really? How did I miss it? Like it's cut off, it's 2021. I'm looking at the latest docs, no such thing as the SDN router. So I'm like, all right, how is it created? Look at this. Look at the amount of information. I have the documentation from Proxmox open. No such thing exists. In the end, I said, there's no such thing. And it says, I apologize for the confusion, you're correct. Is this actually it? So, uh, you know, it's not, I don't think saying this is intelligence does it justice, all right? So the thing is, this is my opinion and I have no formal training or whatnot, all right? This is just my observing it. Basically, it is a Statistical process, it wants to give you a, an answer. So even if you ask it stuff in gobbledygook, it's gonna give you stuff in gobbledygook. That's what it, what, what it does. So it makes stuff up. Now I don't do networks, but I know I cannot click a button that doesn't exist, all right? So just a question for, for kind of developers out there. You ask it questions about software and where are you gonna get? Are you gonna do a SDN router interface? How do you know it's making stuff up? Simple, you have to know what you're working with. At a certain point in time, we have to stop thinking that there are shortcuts. There are none, all right? You have to know what you're working with in order to give it good enough prompts. And if people tell me, honestly, they need better prompts, sure. So I'm basically supposed to tell it how to implement it and it's supposed to give me an answer. Well, fuck it, I did all the work then, so why do I need it? And there's a, also an interesting arc here. If we get the new generations, which we are getting, that rely heavily on ChatGPT, even to do interviews or do, uh, do code. So uh, basically, what's the point, right? So if they're only asking ChatGPT question and giving gobbledygook answers, the question is, well, why do we need these people to begin with? I can ask questions as well. And it's, it's really unfortunate. I don't understand the, the point of asking ChatGPT for code solutions. The point of this job for me was always I, I enjoyed solving problems. Now, if this exists and if you use this extensively, well, what's the point? Are you, do you want to solve tasks? Do you want to make money? Like, how does this fit? 
there was this one time I was on a, uh, on a trip and I'm talking to this diver and because I bitch about stuff constantly and there I am in a car in Cyprus talking about and you know what these young kids using ChatGPT the guy has no idea what ChatGPT is so I say they're not using their brain and, and I, they're constantly using this and it's it's just insane and he's looking at me and it's like oh like satnav yes exactly like satnav we don't even drive anymore all right we punch in i have a little screen here uh dylan has a tesla which has a screen this size so you punch in and then it just drives you but you can argue that's fine you can really argue that's fine but you know if you apply it to life then what's you know are, are the new generations of programmers even developing problem-solving skills is one of my questions. You know, if you're asking ChatGPT to do everything, what are you doing? So it's like at some point, I think I wanted to create a plugin for living spec because it's a spec and basically just tell ChatGPT, go there and put the code here. You know, it's, we haven't done that yet, but uh, yeah. Anywho, that's kind of what I wanted to share today so i hope that wasn't oops uh too bad that's about it thank you <laughs>